Fate was bullet every day until he awakened the true power of his SS rank skill. Fate is your typical disgusting loser with the job of holding a flag post in front of the castle walls. He's been there the whole day and complains about how starving he is feeling right now. He then notices a group of four adventurers passing nearby. One of them brags about hitting level 6 while doing their hunt a few hours ago. But that only made Fate jealous. Despite that feeling, he knows he won't ever be able to be an adventurer. His stomach starts growling again and he thinks he is useless. He's hungry, he has a stupid job, and his unique skill is worthless. Let's be fair, his stats are all one, and his skill is gluttony. Luckily, his shift is almost over, until the trio arrives. The leader of the trio then drops a few coins on the floor as payment and tells Fate to pick it up. Fate complies and slowly starts picking the coins. Yet, one of the holy knights steps on his hand. He starts insulting Fate, saying that he is so filthy that he didn't notice him. And as you expect, Fate is a bullied person who has no way to fight back. His stomach makes noise again, making the leader of the trio mad. The guy kicks Fate a few more times, and the girl joins in. She starts calling Fate's skill useless and says that he only survives because they give him money. Fate explains that in this world, everyone's worth depends on the special powers they got from gods. They call them skills. The trio leader then orders Fate to get up. But when he tries, the other guy steps on his face and asks him to hurry up. They increase their bullying, claiming that he needs to be disciplined for failing to comply with orders. However, a voice from afar tells them to stop. This is the famous Lady Roxy Hart. She complains in her elegant way that holy knights shouldn't abuse the people they swore to protect. The leader claims it's also his duty to provide employment to useless people like Fate. She then asks why he is treating Fate like that. The guy twists her words and tells the others they will be leaving. Roxy walks toward Fate and asks if he's okay while trying to get him up. She uses her handkerchief to clean up his injuries, but Fate notices the way the trio's leader is looking at Roxy. She finishes cleaning him up and he thanks her for her help. Later at night, Fate is in the bar thinking about Roxy's words, but Fate knows that the trio might take revenge on her, so he decides to not involve her in this thing. The bar owner comes to him and asks if the trio did the same as usual. He tells Fate if this keeps up, he will end up like the last guy. Fate walks on the streets and his stomach is making noise again. Turns out his skill allows him to be always hungry. He calls that skill stupid and wishes he could have been born with something more useful. Fate then suddenly stops and notices some thieves climbing up the walls. He starts running back to alert Roxy about the situation, and she heads inside. Fate hears blades clashing and screams until they suddenly stop. He then sees from the distance an injured thief. He decides to confront the thief head-on and uses the spear pole to send him to the next life. Suddenly, everything around Fate starts to get dark. He hears a voice saying that his gluttony skill has been activated and that his stats are being updated. When he checks them, he sees that every single one is over 100. He also gained two new skills, Identify and Telepathy. He doesn't understand what just happened. Roxy then comes running toward him to check if he got hurt by the thief. She notices that he doesn't look well, and she is worried. She never said that, but Fate managed to read her thoughts. She decides to thank him for helping her succeed in her duty and asks if he would like to work for her family. Fate starts to consider the situation. Does he want to continue being treated like trash? Or does he want to have a bright future by working for Roxy? In the end, he agrees to work for her. He heads back home and is still confused by his status changes. He doesn't know what his new skills are, but thinks that telepathy is what allowed him to hear Roxy's thoughts. He then starts to worry about his gluttony skill activation and what's going on with his body. But he quickly brushes it off because he can now beat monsters. The next day, Fate goes to the shopping street and starts looking for a weapon. However, his budget is only two coins. He decides to check the blades and uses his identify skill to check every single blade. Suddenly, the swords start talking. Fate starts to panic but tries to not make a scene. His skill allows him to know the name of the sword, Greed. The sword then tells him that if Fate buys it, the sword will make him stronger. The sword then calls him Gluttony. Fate is confused about how the sword knows. The sword explains they have a lot in common. Fate then makes his decision and buys the sword. Meanwhile, the trio is complaining because Roxy is trying to hire Fate without asking them. The girl continues to complain about Roxy, but the guy explains that Roxy's family and theirs are part of the great five families that support the kingdom. So, acting against her will raise some problems. Meanwhile, Fate goes to the outskirts of the city with his new sword. The sword then says that enemies come, 
and Fate starts to panic. A goblin jumps on him, but Fate's eyes change, and he slices the goblin in one slash. The other voice speaks again, explaining that Gluttony was activated and will increase his stats. He also gained the Strength Boost skill. Fate is confused that this happened again, but there are more goblins around. They all dash to attack Fate, but he manages to parry and slice them, one after one. His Gluttony skill keeps activating every time he defeats a goblin. A few hours later, Fate finally manages to defeat hundreds of goblins. He now has a few more skills, but his stats are now crazy. His lowest stat is nearly 500, and his strength is triple of that. Greed then asks if Fate stopped being hungry. Fate is initially confused, but he realizes that his stomach never made noise today. Fate then asks Greed what this is all about. Greed explains it's all because of gluttony. Normally, people must fight and win battles to increase their stats or level up. However, gluttony is a cheat skill. It steals the stats and skills of whatever he defeats. The only problem is that he cannot get experience and level up. Fate asks how Greed knows about it, and the sword explains they're the same. Despite being confused, Fate notices the adventurer's group coming in his direction. Greed tells him that he shouldn't let people know about his gluttony skill because it defies the divine law. Fate realizes what this means and decides that he cannot party up. He must always fight alone. Greed then tells him that he's not alone, because Greed is with him. Fate accepts those words and decides to return. Yet, Greed stops him from returning without collecting the goblin's ears. Fate is confused, but Greed explains that he will get paid if he sells them. He managed to earn 3 silver and 80 bronze coins and decided to get some meat for dinner. But he bumps into a shady guy coming from a dark alley. There's a little girl with the shady guy. She touches Fate, and he hears her voice begging for his help. Fate then uses his skill to identify the shady guy's skills however it quickly disappears. Greed explains the guy has a conceal ability, which hides everything from identify. Greed asks what Fate will do, and he reveals that he will save the girl. The girl ends up in a warehouse, chained against the wall. The guy starts mocking her, telling that she will become a toy for the Holy Knights. Fate is watching closely, but Greed stops him from moving. Greed explains that guy is stronger than him and that he should turn away. But Fate wants to help anyone he sees suffering in front of him, especially because he now has the power to do it. The guy stops and starts walking away, giving the girl a chance to sob. She then hears some footsteps, but it's Fate, telling her she will be alright. He frees her from the chains and tells her to hurry up and escape. However, the other guy has returned. The guy explains he sometimes runs into guys like Fate. Pathetic useless dudes who think they're some sort of hero of justice. Fate simply smiles at the girl and pulls out Greed to fight the bad guy. Greed has an idea and tells Fate to back away because the other guy thinks Fate is weaker than himself. Therefore, Greed wants Fate to take advantage of the guy's confidence. Fate follows the instructions and starts running away with the girl. Fate manages to reach the end point, and Greed tells him it's now the time to attack. Fate then knocks the boxes where the other guy is passing by and uses them to jump and attack him. The guy manages to dodge, only taking a scratch on his cheek. The guy then starts to get serious, and his sword starts to glow. Greed knows that skill will be a problem and tells Fate to strike the guy down through his weapon. Fate uses the boxes again to leap toward the guy and manages to not only cut his sword in half but also slice the guy up. While the guy is still alive, Fate asks what he meant about bringing the girl to the Holy Knights. He questions who ordered the guy to kidnap the girl. After some seconds, the guy agrees to reveal who hired him. It was Hotto Vileric, the guy who randomly used to beat Fate. Turns out the guy is a crazy dude who likes to show orphan kids some archery skills. But instead of shooting apples, he's shooting brains. Fate then takes the girl outside, telling her she will be fine from now on. He then takes her back to the orphanage, where she reunites with the nuns. They thank Fate for helping Sahara. He then walks away, and Greed explains that not only his stats increased, but he also got the one-handed sword technique. He congratulates Fate for his new skill, but Fate is confused. Greed explains this is a technical skill that allows him to get tech arts. They're literally secret techniques. In this case, he can attack twice at the same time. Greed then asks about tomorrow, since it will be Fate's first day working for the hearts. Fate confirms, and Greed asks if he's going to show up looking like a pleb. This reminds Fate that he forgot to buy new clothes. Meanwhile, in a bar, there's an old man revealing the news that Sir Mason was struck down by a divine dragon in Galia. The barman asks what will happen to the Hart family, and the old man replies that Roxy will succeed him. The main problem is that Sir Mason was keeping the Holy Knights in check, if you can call it that. 
and the old man isn't sure she can keep them in line. The next day, Fate arrives at the Holy Night District, looking fresh. He ends up meeting her by the fountain, and she smiles, explaining she was waiting for him. However, Fate doesn't reply. He's smitten by her beauty. He tells her she's pretty, and she gets shy. She then takes him inside on a tour, and her first stop is in front of a grave. Turns out this is her father, and she's introducing Fate to him. Fate is initially confused. She explains it happened five days ago when he met a divine dragon. She explains that it was her family's duty to contain the monsters this year. Despite being a dangerous task, it shouldn't be deadly. Still, a divine dragon that had been missing for 1,000 years suddenly appeared and her father went to another world. The maid chef, Haru appears, Roxy introduces the two to each other, and she immediately starts threatening Fate, telling him to behave like a proper servant. Turns out, Fate is later tasked with trimming the bushes, every day. Haru then appears, explaining that Roxy wants to see him. He follows Haru but finds it weird about his stomach situation. Haru takes him to another part of the garden, where he meets Roxy. She gives him some tea and asks how he's been adapting to his job. But Fate is only thinking about his stomach, he's feeling even hungrier every second. Suddenly, he starts to feel dizzy and collapses. He wakes up in his room at night and reads a note. It's from Roxy, asking him to take a day off and rest. Fate decides to ask Greed why he's feeling hungrier. Greed explains that once the gluttony skill gets a taste of souls, it cannot be stopped. Fate is confused, but Greed explains the more he devours, the stronger he will get. But that will also make him want to devour more and more. By activating his skill, he will be destined to hunt and devour souls until his last day alive. Fate asks what will happen if he doesn't. Greed explains there's only two possibilities. He will either starve to death, or he will lose control and go on a rampage, putting everyone in danger. Fate is shocked because that will make him a monster. Greed then gives him some advice. When Fate's hunger approaches its limits, it will be visible in his eyes. Fate then checks his reflection in the mirror and finds out he has a sharing in from Wish. Without any option, Fate decides to head out of the city at night to hunt. Fate finally manages to find a group of goblins and notices that his skill made them stop moving. He slices through the goblins with ease and smiles like a maniac. However, small goblins aren't enough to satisfy him. Greed tells him to head over to the hobgoblin forests. He follows those instructions and he meets some hobgoblins. He starts slicing them up, but it's never enough to free him from his hunger. After a huge hunt, he finally manages to stop feeling hungry. He doesn't want to feel like this again. Greed tells him that he must hunt monsters from time to time. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking. Fate hides and notices a huge monster carrying a human in hand. Greed explains this is a goblin king. Fate's eyes immediately change, and Greed explains they have similar stats, but the goblin has health regeneration. Greed explains it heals the wounds, enabling it to fight for a long period of time. The Goblin King sits down and enjoys his human dessert. This gives Fate the opportunity to climb a tree and strike the Goblin King's arm. However, Fate gets distracted to see the human dessert laying on the ground. The monster tries to smash him, but Fate manages to dodge its hits. He's clearly afraid of the attacks, but Greed tells him to trust him and rush in. Fate follows and manages to not only block the monster's attacks but also slice him down. The gluttony skill activates again, making Fate reach a whole new level. He now has several skills, and all his starts reach five digits. He then sits down, exhausted, and Greed says that the real deal will begin now. He explains that Fate's stats can now use Greed's first level. Fate is confused, but Greed says it's another form. Greed explains that he can get new functions if Fate offers him his stats, but that will cost every single stat point. Fate refuses, but Greed explains that if he doesn't, he won't be able to use him anymore. He then says that Fate can either be strong by himself, or he can make him Greed strong, and they work together. Fate decides to accept the deal and gives him his stats. Greed then starts transforming into a magic bow. He just needs to draw the bow and the arrow will appear. Fate decides to test it and turns out the arrow can track the target, easily defeating a goblin that was nearby. He then decides to take the goblin king's ears and drops them at Saraha's orphanage. The next day, Roxy tries to sneak out of the house. Fate doesn't recognize her and tells her to stop moving, thinking she is a thief. She gets a jump scare and turns around. Fate apologizes for scaring her, mentioning she looks different than usual. He asks if she is heading to the castle, but she simply replies that she will go into town on a secret inspection. Roxy then decides to make it a date, in her head. She tells him that fate will escort her during the inspection. The two head off, but Roxy seems to be having too much fun. He tells her to slow down, but she tells him to stop calling her Roxy, otherwise, people will notice her. 
She then asks him to call her Lexi. They leave the alleyway and step into the city streets. It's filled with life, merchants, and all kinds of people. He notices that she stopped by a stall and sees her looking at a red gem. She explains that she's interested in them because she's a girl. She then notices some sort of rocks and asks the merchant if those are also gems. The merchant explains that's or it can have a gem inside or not. Fate then tries to look at the rocks until he notices Roxy simply looking at a blue gem. He realizes that she seems like a normal girl instead of a holy knight. The merchant takes advantage of the moment, proposing a discount if Fate buys the gem to his girl. Fate gets shy and Roxy decides to simply walk away. He follows her, and she asks if Fate has any warrior acquaintance. Fate asks about Minerva and Oliver, but Roxy explains she needs to talk to active warriors, not retired ones. He gets curious, but they're interrupted when they hear a conversation about the Goblin Massacre. Turns out people think it was a high-level monster who did it. Roxy then starts chasing the two guys who were talking about it. One of them thinks the monster theory is stupid because the Goblin King ears were donated to an orphanage. Roxy then interrupts the guys and asks about the details. She asks if they know anything about the roaming monster, but they don't and walk away. She then asks Fate to take her to where the warriors gather. He takes her to the bar and the barman, who thought Fate was dead, is surprised to see him alive. He introduces Roxy as his co-worker, but the barman starts picking him up mentioning that he disappeared for a while, and now brings his girl. Roxy reacts by destroying her cup, not because she's angry, but because that's what she wants, to be clapped. They have a huge meal, and the barman explains what he knows about the mysterious goblin wiper. She thinks it's a wandering monster that has migrated from another region. The barman explains that will be bad for business, making fate confused. The barman goes into detail, saying that people must pass through the goblin plains if they want to do business in or out of the city. Therefore, people won't want to travel and it will destroy the city's economy. Fate starts realizing his mistake when an old man gets inside the bar. He thinks he's seeing a ghost because he also thought that Fate was dead. Turns out the old man also has some information. They think the roaming monster is a lick. Therefore, the Holy Knights will be taking direct action to deal with it. Fate then gets curious and asks why she didn't know about the hunt. She explains that since her father passed away, the Valeric family is literally using the situation to deal with stuff without informing her. Suddenly, they hear two voices and check the commotion. They notice that Hado is pulling a kid's arm and Roxy tells him to release the kid. The girl claims they're just taking a lost kid into their protection. But Roxy orders Fate to help the kid. While doing it, the trio leader tries to talk to Fate, but our boy ignores him. Roxy then tells the trio she will be taking care of the kid and decides to question the leader. She asks why he didn't inform her about the wandering monster hunt, but the guy just ignores her and walks away. The kid then reveals he hates holy knights, making Roxy apologize. He's confused, but Fate quickly asks if he got lost from his mother. The kid confirms, leading Fate and Roxy to help him look for his mother. Fate thinks that he also got lost when he arrived in the city five years ago. However, he was helped by a female holy knight. He wonders what happened to her because he has never seen her around since then. But we can clearly notice it was Roxy when she had short hair. After walking around for some hours, they still cannot find the kid's mother. However, she appears some time later, looking for her son. Fate is happy they managed to find her, and he gets enchanted when he sees Roxy's pure smile. She why he's staring at her, and he tries to make an excuse. He says that it's getting late, and they need to return. Roxy then realizes the situation and makes him promise her one thing. If they get in trouble, they will do it together. He promises they will and they rush home, just to get scolded by the head maid. Later at night, Fate asks Greed if there's a way to hunt monsters without Roxy finding out. Greed suggests he gets a special mask. Greed explains that the mask will make him look different to whoever sees him. Fate thinks that's perfect and buys it. Meanwhile, the Holy Knights are having a meeting without Roxy's consent, where the trio's leader claims they will discuss their excursion to Galia. At the Hart family castle, Fate is casually pruning flowers. Leading a double life is really telling on him. Lady Roxy approaches him, telling him she has a secret mission for him. He asks her if it's going to be another inspection. Next we can see Fate in Lady Roxy's carriage. The carriage finally arrives at its destination and Aisha Hart, who is Roxy's mother, comes out to greet them. Roxy's mother asks her who accompanied her. She introduces Fate to her mother as a servant she hired. They exchange pleasantries. Greed tells Fate he's relieved Aisha is nice. Aisha tells Fate to come closer. She asks him if he likes her daughter. Roxy is embarrassed by this question. She questions her mother, wondering why she asked Fate such a question. Aisha tells her she just wants to know his opinion about her as his employer. 
They are both relieved she means the business-wise relationship. Fate tells Aisha in all sincerity that he cares for Roxy and would serve her all his life if allowed. Roxy is embarrassed once again and rushes off to her room in a bid to hide it. Aisha tells him she can't believe her daughter turned out to be a holy knight. She tells him she worries Roxy is pushing herself too hard now that she's the head after her father passed. Fate tells her Roxy is a good holy knight who performs her duty well and is loved by the people. Aisha is happy to hear this. At the vineyard, Fate joins other servants to harvest grapes. One of the servants offers him a cup of freshly juiced grapes. Fate thanks him. He takes a sip and compliments its sweetness. The servant explains how the lords and servants have worked together to make the grapes have such great flavor. Fate asks if Sir Mason also had a hand in this. The servant tells him he heard the sad news of his passing. He tells Fate they weren't sure Roxy would come around for the harvest because of that. He asks the servant if Roxy helped with the yearly harvest. He tells Fate that's one of the things she comes for, the other is hunting monsters. Fate asks about the monster hunting part. The servant tells him the current harvest time is not just for grapes but several food stuff. He tells Fate the monsters show up because they are usually hungry. Later in the day, Fate walks down the path leading to the house and sees a girl walking towards him with a huge battle axe hoisted on her shoulder. He hasn't seen the girl around there before. As they walk beside each other, the girl calls out to him. When Fate looks at her eyes, they look just like his when he activates his skill. He tries to analyze her but can't get anything. She calls out to him again and he asks her what she wants. She tells him she came too early. Fate asks her what she means. She tells him she came for the cobbles but he can have them. She tells him he owes her one when they meet in the future. As she walks away, Fate asks Greed if he knows who she was. Greed tells him he has no idea who she is. At that point, Roxy meets up with Fate. She looks back at the strange girl, telling Fate she's a Galian. She goes into a history lesson. She tells him 4,000 years ago Galia was a strong nation until a surge of monsters caused its collapse by eliminating all its citizens. Fate tells her apparently some citizens survived. She tells him she hasn't seen such a full-blooded Galian before. She tells Fate they should both head to the house together. Fate tells her he knows about her monster hunt and asks her if she'll be okay. She tells him she won't be alone because some warriors will accompany her. She also tells him he shouldn't worry since she's a magic knight after all. At night, Fate decides to hunt the kobolds. The crown beast has some kobold warriors guarding it, with several junior kobolds moving with the pack as well. He pulls him out and takes down several junior kobolds. He shoots at the crown beast but it uses one of its warriors to block the shot. The others try to protect the crown beast but Fate takes them down. After taking down all the kobolds and his gluttony skill absorbing their skills, he's not convinced he has enough to take down the crowned beast. He shoots at the crowned beast, thinking he can bring him down, but it catches both his arrows. Greed tells Fate to get close to it and fight it with his sword form. Fate rushes in without thinking. The crown beast releases a skill which Greed warns Fate about but it's too late. Greed tries to get him back on his feet but he doesn't respond. The crown beast tries to land the finishing blow but it loses its arm in a split second. Fate is back in his feet. Greed praises him for tricking the crown beast into thinking he was knocked out cold. The crown beast launches its skill again but Fate dodges out of the way. But he is hit mid-air by a cobbled warrior. Fate ends the cobbled warrior and absorbs his stats with his gluttony skill. At this point, Greed tells him he can use his first level hidden art but he will need 10% of his stats for it. Fate tells him to take it so they can end the crown beast. Greed transforms into a huge special bow. As Fate charges Greed's skill, the Crown Beast also charges his skill. They both launch their skills at the same time but Greed's skill surpasses that of the Crown King. It literally gives him a shortcut to heaven. Greed tells Fate the regeneration skill he got from the Goblin King has already healed him. Back at the house, Roxy is happy the kobolds were taken down and they can return to the capital. Aisha is happy Roxy looks so excited around Fate. Later in the day, Aisha calls Fate to her bedroom and asks him to stay by Roxy's side to support her. Fate doesn't think he's worthy but Aisha tells him he just needs to have a desire to help her. At that point she coughs for a while and Fate rushes to hold her up. She tells him her time is running out, which is why she wants him to look out for Roxy in her place. She begs him and tells him to take his time to think about it. The next day Fate is at the tavern with an eye patch over his right eye. He thinks he's not worthy to stand before Roxy. The door to the tavern opens and the bartender's friend comes in. He tells the bartender, Sir Hado is going to join the hunt for corpse. Fate is surprised by this. The bartender tells his friend it's Sir Hado's way of getting some glory from completing an easy task. His friends tell him Sir Hado is better off going for the Galia expedition. The bartender tells him Sir Hado only goes where it's safest for him. 
fate is surprised there's another expedition so soon after Sir Mason's death. At the knight's house, several knights are preparing to head off for the expedition, including Roxy and the trio knights. Before leaving, Roxy visits her father's grave and tells him all that's happened, asking him to watch over her. Fate advises her not to go because she might not return. She tells him she has decided to go and walks away. The trio knights are happy they'll be able to get rid of Roxy once and for all. While Hado will be going for the Galia expedition with the hopes of doing away with Roxy, the other two will be going to another city for research. Hado thinks they're hiding something from him and wants in on what they will be going to do. Raphael just tells him to make sure he takes care of Roxy. Later at night, though fate cannot disobey direct orders or protect Roxy, there is one thing he can do. He stands in the way of Sir Hado and his patrol. Sir Hado comes face to face with him, happy to have found corpse. His henchmen leap forward with their weapons drawn and try to attack Fate. As they close the distance to Fate, he brings down all three henchmen one by one. Hado doesn't look so confident anymore. Fate looks back at him and his henchmen ditch him faster than the speed of light. Even Einstein would be impressed. Hado tries to rally them but his henchmen leave him standing there alone to face Fate. Fate walks up to him and Hado draws his sword. Fate takes off his mask and Hado immediately recognizes him. Fate tells Hado to show him the knight powers he's so proud of. Fate activates his skills and looks at Hado's stats. The holy sword technique catches his eye. It's the special skill needed to become a holy knight. Fate wonders how Hado got such a skill. Hado tells him it will be foolish to face him in a sword fight. Hado activates the skill and strikes at Fate. But Fate is already out of the way. Hado is shocked and Fate lands behind him. He tells him his skill takes way too long to launch. Hado turns around and strikes at Fate with his sword. But Fate simply slices his holy sword into two. Hado looks shocked at half of his sword. Hado backs away from Fate and considers taking to his heels. Fate reads his body language and tells him not to run but to uphold his pride as a holy knight. Hado keeps backing up. Fate tells him he's pathetic. Hado trips and falls and Fate calls him a clown. Fate lifts him up like a ragdoll and reminds him of a statement he made. Defiant dogs need to be taught discipline. Hado begs him to stop but runs to a tree and gives Hado's face a nice makeover. Fate keeps falling trees around the forest with Hado's face until he's unrecognizable. Hado begs him once again to stop. Fate is pissed he has the nerve to beg considering how he treated other people like meaningless thrash. Fate is also angry Roxy would be walking into danger because of him. Hado begs him to spare his life and Fate asks him what his response was when he told him the same thing. He throws Hado into the air and activates Greed's skill. Greed turns into a crossbow and Fate fires several shots at Hado while he's still in the air. When Hado finally lands on the ground, his limbs are gone. Hado asks him why he won't finish him off and begs him to end his sorrow. Fate tells him he has a question for him first. Hado asks him if it's about Roxy. He recalls her volunteering for the Galia expedition and how she vowed to give her life to save the people. Fate confirms that Roxy would indeed say those words. Hado promises to cancel Roxy's Galia expedition if Fate spares his life. Fate raises greed over Hado's chest. Hado begs him not to do anything stupid like getting revenge for Roxy. Fate tells him to shut his mouth and gives Greed a taste of Hado's innards. His skill activates and his stats increase. Fate now gains the Holy Knight technique. Greed tells him he has now become a Holy Knight. Greed tells him he can use Hado's stats to access his second level. Fate gives him the go-ahead and Greed takes up his stats. He transforms into his second level which is a great scythe. Greed tells Fate his blade can now cut through anything in the universe. The next day, Roxy prepares to leave. The servants stand around her to see her off but they don't look too happy. She tells them not to look so gloomy because three years will pass by in a flash. She tells Haru to look after things in her absence. She comes face to face with Fate and they stare at each other for a while. She assures him they will meet again. Fate tells her to take care of herself and she leaves. Later, Haru gives Fate a letter of recommendation Roxy left for him. Roxy recommended him to a lord's manor to keep him safe. However, Fate rejects it and tells Haru he will make a way for himself as a warrior. Fate packs his belongings. Greed asks him if he has made up his mind. He tells Greed if he can't stop Roxy from traveling. The least he can do is to support her. Fate bids farewell to the other servants and Haru hands him his pay for the work he has done. She wishes him good luck and he leaves. He enters a carriage, hoping that he's strong enough to protect Roxy. At the laboratory, the female scientist asks Rain for her attention. She asks her if she knows about the lick everyone in town is talking about. She shows Rain the slain goblins and observes the arrow marks aren't normal arrow marks. Rain takes a close look and is fascinated by it. She opens up a book and shows the female scientist a magic bow. 
She tells her she thinks that the arrow from that magic bow did it. The female scientist asks her if magic arrows are different from fireballs. Ryan tells her it's an ability possessed by the Black Sword, one of the weapons of mortal sin. Weapons of mortal sin are made from special materials that can manipulate magic at a high level. Those weapons can control magic power, and Rain thinks they can increase the skills of whoever wields them. Meanwhile, Fade is resting in the public carriage and wakes up when they arrive in the town of Tetra. He is nostalgic because the city has hardly changed. Greed asks him if he's been to the city before and he tells him he was here five years ago. He tells Greed he passed through the town on his way to the capital. Fate approaches a carriage driver and asks him if he is heading to Galia. The driver tells him his carriage won't be going today because they could be attacked by monsters at night. He tells him to come back tomorrow. Fate walks away quickly. At the local pub, Sed is asking several warriors to help save his village. They brush away his money, telling him it's not to get them to hunt monsters. They start bullying Set and Fate comes to his rescue. He easily overpowers the bully and pushes him to the ground. The other warriors try to fight Fate, but he overpowers them. They run away from the pub. The man tries to thank Fate but B cuts him off, telling him he hasn't seen him in a long time. In the past, Fate was bullied by Set and his friends who called him a good-for-nothing. Fate's father was a warrior who used to fight against monsters. Fate would always make herbs for his father because he was always injured. His father was impressed that Fate was so good at making herbal mixtures. After Fate's dad passed away, the villagers wondered who would look after him now that his dad is gone. Fate was exiled because the village chief thought he was useless. The villagers chased him away from the village, calling him a good-for-nothing. Back to the present, Set knelt before Fate, begging for his help. Fate remembers Set, who is the son of the village chief who exiled him. Set tells him he knows his request is selfish, but he tells him he needs a warrior's strength. Greed tells him it's a good opportunity to satiate his skill, gluttony. Set leads him back to the village but the village chief who is Set's dad isn't happy to see Set return with Fate. Set takes Fate to his house and offers him a beverage. Set apologizes for the way the chief behaved and Fate tells him he's used to it. Fate asks Set to tell him about the monsters. Set tells him the monsters showed up about a month ago and witnesses think they are multiple monsters that can fly. He tells Fate these monsters are unlike anything the village has ever seen before. That's why they decided to hire some warriors. Just then Fate's stomach growls. Set teases him about always being hungry and goes to get Fate something to eat. Fate asks Greed if he knows the kind of monsters attacking the village. Greed tells him the monsters are most likely gargoyles. He tells Fate they are smart monsters who use probe attacks to see how humans react before the full pack attacks together. Set's daughter walks up to Fate and asks him who he's talking to. Fate tells her he's talking to himself. She gives him a piece of candy. Set comes back with some food, apologizing for how small it is. Fate tells him it's more than enough and thanks him for the meal. Fate takes a bite from the food and immediately becomes very tired. He passes out right after. Set wonders what made him pass out and Set's daughter tells him she gave him some candy. Set asks her about it and she tells him Set's dad gave it to her. Set tries to wake him up but then a scream pierces through the night. Set looks out the window and he's shocked at the sight before him. The gargoyles are attacking the village. Set makes the antidote for fate. Meanwhile, the village is glowing a bright orange in the dark night. The village chief is running down the street looking for fate so he can be used as bait. The gargoyle picks him up and knows dinner is settled for the night. Set gives Fate the antidote and he wakes up. Flames flare outside Set's house which jolts Fate into action. He picks up Greed and heads outside. Fate tries to find survivors but the sight of the village weakens his spirits. The gargoyles are still busy having dinner and Fate comes face to face with one. The gargoyle launches a breath of flame at Fate who dodges it. Greed tells him he can't match the gargoyles if they have the high ground. Fate listens to him, unlike a certain Jedi we know. Fate analyzes the skills of the gargoyles and looks over their stats. Fate thinks its fireball skill is troublesome and orders Greed to transform into a scythe. The gargoyle launches a fireball at Fate once again. Instead of dodging it, he cuts through it. The gargoyles notice that Fate is putting up a fight and they all surround him. They launch their fireballs at him simultaneously. Fate uses the scythe which cuts through the fireball and then cuts through the gargoyles one after the other. Fate's gluttony skill activates, his stats increase, and he gets the fireball magic skill. 
Fate notices there is still one gargoyle left. This is the pack leader. Fate analyzes the leader and notices he has a higher level than normal gargoyles and an additional skill of fire resistance. The leader lunges at Fate to use a fireball at point-blank range, but Greed warns Fate about it and tells him to take advantage of that. Fate immediately lunges at the diving leader. Fate strikes the leader down with the scythe and his gluttony skill activates. Fate's stats increase once again and he gets the skill of fire resistance. The next day, Fate and Set stand over what's left of the village. Only Set and a few other villagers survived the attack. Fate returns to his old family house and goes to the grave site of his parents. The site brings back memories of his childhood and he tells his father he's doing good now. Fate then takes the ride from the carriage driver. The carriage driver asks him if he will be able to protect him if he's so sleepy. Fate apologizes to him. The driver tells Fate he's paying him for his services, so he better ensure his safety. Suddenly, the man brings the carriage to a halt. Bandits stand in front of the carriage. The leader of the bandits rallies his men to attack him and Fate. At that moment, a huge sword falls from the sky behind the group of bandits, breaking their formation and knocking them to the ground. Greed tells Fate there's only one person who can do that. Fate looks up to see the girl he saw some days back. She then tells Fate he owns her for those cobbles. Fate doesn't understand what she means. She asks to join them, but when she gets on the carriage it tilts backward. The girl yells her weapon, Sloth, to go back to normal, and the carriage rights itself. The girl asks Fate what his name is. Fate introduces himself to her and she calls him Fate of Gluttony. Fate asks her how she knows about Gluttony and she replies she's also a deadly sin skill owner. Fate asks her about the deadly sin skill and she asks him if Greed didn't tell him about it. The girl introduces herself as mine with the skill of wrath. Her stomach rumbles and Fate gives her some beef jerky. The driver tells them they are about to arrive in the city. The driver tells them Lord Rudolph is preparing a welcome party for the expedition of Galia's army. Fate asks the driver if it's Lady Roxy's expedition and the driver tells him they would be arriving at the town soon. The driver thanks Fate and walks away. Fate asks Greed what they should do, and Greed tells him they should go to an inn. Mine falls asleep while standing and she rests on Fate for support. Fate drops Mine on a bed in a room he got at an inn. Greed tells Fate he had no idea Mine was still alive. Fate asks him how he knows Mine and he says he was in a bad relationship with her and Sloth in the past. Greed tells Fate Sloth is a deadly sin weapon just like him. Fate asks him about deadly sin skills and Greed tells him about the seven deadly sin skills which violate God's principles. He tells Fate Gluttony is the most sinful skill because it can break through the concept of levels. Fate asks Greed if his punishment is his insatiable hunger and Greed tells him they all have their individual punishments. Fate tells Greed he's quite unlucky going from people laughing at him for being powerless to having to constantly feed his skill to survive. Greed tells him he can't hesitate if he wants to survive, or he'll be consumed by gluttony. Greed tells him to resist and maintain a half-starvation mode. Fate puts on his mask and gets out to hunt. Fate comes across a sandman and he turns Greed into a bow. Greed tells him to cache his new fire skill before shooting the arrow and Fate is impressed with the results. The sand is defeated easily. Fate's skill activates, he sees other sandmen and wants to devour them, but Greed tells him to endure it. At the inn, Mine wakes up and she's hungry. She gets something to eat but comes across a poster that says whoever defeats the sand golem will be rewarded. Fate keeps taking down the sandmen one at a time and activating his skill little by little. Greed tells him he's getting used to it and Fate tells him the feeling isn't very pleasant. Greed tells him it's time for him to satisfy gluttony so he doesn't go berserk. The sand golem appears and fate recognizes its smell immediately. A group of soldiers are fighting the sand golem, but they have no chance of defeating it. At that point, fate hits the golem with a magic arrow to draw its attention. He tells the soldiers he'll take down the golem but they tell him he's no match for the golem. Greed tells him he's pulling an act of justice again but fate tells him he just wants to satiate his hunger. The golem shoots balls of sand but fate uses a magic arrow to destroy them. He lunges at the golem and tries to attack it but the golem blocks it. The golem attacks fate with wind magic to trap him so he can crush him with rocks. Fate transforms greed into the scythe and slashes at the golem which storms the wind magic. The core of the golem leaves its body and buries itself in the sand. Greed tells Fate not to let the core disappear and Fate turns Greed into a bow and tells him to take some of his stats. Fate gives Greed the order to fire at will and he does, destroying the core of the sand golem. Fate's skill activates and he obtains the skill of sandstorm magic. Fate thinks the crater created by Greed's arrow is too big, 
but Greed tells him they had no choice. The next day Fate returns to the room to see Mine getting dressed. He asks her where she's heading and she tells him she's going to hunt the Sand Golem. Fate tells her he's taken the Sand Golem down and she is furious she won't get the bounty. Fate tells her he will give her half of it when he cashes in the bounty. Mine asks him about his mask and he tells her it's his identity as corpse. Fate comes out of the inn and asks a carriage driver for a ride. While on their way, Fate asks if Mine isn't actually gluttony because she's always hungry, but she simply replies that anger burns lots of calories. Fate then mentions that despite eating a lot, Mine doesn't grow at all, but that only angers her, and she increases the weight of her weapon. In the end, that ends up breaking the carriage wheel and they're forced to make a stop. Fate apologizes for what happened, but he then notices Mine is missing. He notices a village nearby, realizing she must have gone there. He chases her, noticing how peaceful the village is. Greed explains the village is near Galia, which usually has active monsters around. So, he concludes there must be someone strong who protects this village. Fate then asks about the castle near the village. Greed replies it's the Hassan castle. He continues walking deeper into the village until he notices a guy cleaning up his sword. He decides to ask this guy for the village chief's location mentioning he would like to stay here for the night. The guy turns around, revealing to be an old man and the village chief. Greed notices the old man is holding a holy sword and concludes he's the one protecting the village. Before deciding if he will let Fate stay, the old man asks him for a duel. Fate tries to check the old man's stats, but he notices the usage of appraisal. The old man gets curious, mentioning that despite Fate being level 1, all his stats are over 2 million. Fate is confused because he never noticed the old man use appraisal. However, the man simply asks if Fate accepts or not. Fate unsheathes his sword and the two engage in a battle. The duel is even, until Fate decides to finish it quickly. But the old man blocks his attack and manages to disarm him. However, simply mentions this is destiny and allows him to stay. Fate is confused, but the old man has a condition. Fate must take some lessons from him, but the old man doesn't mention why. Greed and Fate think this is pretty suspicious. The old man, however, starts mentioning everything Fate is bad at. He doesn't know how to counter appraisal, nor how to use his skills in a proper way. He simply claims that Fate's body isn't still used to his power. Despite being able to beat monsters, he won't be able to beat people who attack him. The old man mentions Fate could learn a lot from him, but Greed still thinks this is pretty suspicious. However, Fate knows how rare it is for a holy knight to teach someone in person. He accepts the deal and introduces himself. The old man introduces himself as Barbados. Mine suddenly appears, and Barbados can tell she's a skilled warrior just by looking at her. Fate is ready for his training, except that it is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Barbados explains this is the best method to control all the stats Fate has. Barbados says that warriors who suddenly get stronger have problems controlling their power. Fate considers him a smart man and gets ready to start. Barbados starts by correcting Fate's posture. He then teaches Fate how to hit and how much force to use. He demonstrates how it's done, surprising Fate with his speed. Barbados mentions it's all about how he controls of his own body. If he cannot control, his movements will be weak and slow. Fate gets motivated with the lesson, and they continue their lesson. Despite all tries, he still cannot land a hit on Barbados. Suddenly, his gluttony starts acting up, making Barbados confused. He asks Fate why has his eye changed color. However, the skill starts taking over Fate's body and attacks Barbados. The old man manages to dodge, impressed that Fate improved in an instant. Barbados tries to be a bit more serious and attacks, but Gluttony makes Fate watch the old man move in slow motion. He manages to avoid the combo attack, impressing Greed as Fate manages to move quickly despite his half-starvation mode. Later, Barbados tells Fate he will teach him how to fight in a real battle tomorrow. Fate agrees, but he suddenly smells some monsters coming from the castle. He wonders if there are monsters inside it. Fate finds a frame with Barbados' family picture. Greed mentions that Barbados' son looks a lot like Fate. He guessed that Barbados had a reason why he became the village chief and why he wanted to train him. The next day, Barbados gives Fate a stick and tells him to stop his sword. Fate is confused because it will break. But Barbados replies that Fate can do it because he trained with him. Barbados then attacks, forcing Fate to use his half-starvation state to predict the movement of the sword and let it slide along the stick. He manages to do it, making Barbados proud because Fate can now control his stats. Fate thanks him for all the help and they wait for nighttime. During dinner, Fate tells Barbados they will leave the next morning. However, Mine is more interested in eating than thanking the old man. Barbados tells them to enjoy the food 
but Mayan reveals she cannot feel its taste. Fate is confused, but Greed explains that's the cost for having the wrath skill. Mayan says she doesn't care about it because she has something to do. That reminds Fate of his mission to help Roxy. The old man gets touched by those words and looks to the castle. Fate asks if there's something there, and Barbados decides to explain. Fifteen years ago, that castle used to be his. He explains that he was away to perform some kingdom's duties when his territory was attacked by a lick. He lost all his family and people, and now, the castle is being ruled by the Lick Lord. He claims that his family is still trapped inside, but that story only triggers the gluttony skill. Fate steps outside and looks toward the castle. Barbados follows him, saying that if Fate goes to the castle, he will go with him. He explains that he's still stuck in the past, and he wants to break away from it. Mine also appears, mentioning she will stay to protect the village. That's if they pay her 50 gold. The two decide to go in, but the dark castle suddenly lights up. The fountain suddenly starts working. They can hear the voices of people laughing. They quickly get in and step inside the second floor where the lick should be. But upon getting there, they see a room filled with maids and Barbado's son. Barbado's wife and maids welcome him back, but he cannot believe what's going on. He calls them by their names and approaches them, asking if they are still alive. They reply that he must be tired and asked if he managed to fulfill his duty. He confirms, and they all smile. Fate is confused, but Greed explains that despite looking alive, everyone inside the room is already dead. He reveals this is an illusion, but Barbados doesn't seem to notice. Barbados's son asks if his dad bought something for him, and the old man tries to take it off from his jacket. His son suddenly tries to stab him and pulls a knife to block it. The son then backs away, mentioning he's been protecting the castle in place of his father for years. The illusion tries to guilt trip Barbados into focusing on his work when they were attacked. The illusions claim to still be alive, and that Barbados wants to kill them. But fate tells the old man that he will deal with the illusions. He wants to use greed's scythe mode to cut through the whole illusion skill, but greed replies everyone will be also cut with it. That means that everyone's souls will be consumed by gluttony and live forever in suffering. Fate hesitates because doesn't want them to have that destiny. Barbados then asks him to deal with Lick Lord while he deals with his own family. The old man duels with his son, impressed by how strong he has become. Meanwhile, follows the smell of monsters and finds himself in a hall. He easily finds the Lick and uses Greed's Bomo to shoot it. However, the Lick is still up and kicking. Fate looks into his stats, all over the 2 million mark. The Lick then attacks, but Fate decides to control his power, just as Barbados has taught him. He follows up from a parry and destroys the Lick's hands. Power the monster doesn't give up and starts manipulating dead bodies. Fate hears the bodies asking to be saved, but he cannot attack them. He then looks behind and sees the bodies near him. Luckily, Barbados arrives in time and slices their tendons. He then sees the body of his late wife, saying the same thing she did when they last saw each other. He remembers his family asking why he always had to take the most dangerous missions. But Barbados simply replied he was going to quickly deal with it in return. Barbados realizes he wasn't quick enough, but now he must put them to rest. He uses his Grand Cross skill to purify the bodies and defeat the Lick, but the monster is still resisting. Fate looks around and sees the sword of Barbados' son. He picks it up, wanting to help the old man and they cross their swords to activate the same skill. It's a lot more powerful, and the Lick is defeated. Barbados retrieves his family's bodies, apologizing for the time it took him to do it. He suddenly sees their ghosts, and his son tells him it's okay because he just saved them. He then gives his son the souvenir he always promised and embraces the two before everyone disappears. The house then returns to complete darkness, and Barbados asks his family to wait for him. They step outside, and Barbados suddenly reveals that he has broken his level limit. He thinks it's because he was fighting with fate. Greed confirms, mentioning that can only happen to people who open their hearts to deadly sin skill users. The two only return in the morning, which annoyed mine, because she was up all night to protect the village. Barbados simply pulls a bag of gold coins and gives it to her. She takes it, but Fate thinks she's greedy. Mine replies she needs gold to rebuild the village, and gold never lies, which is something he will learn if lives long enough. Fate is confused, but Barbados mentions he has seen Mine before. Turns out he saw her 50 years ago, when monsters appeared in that area. Fate is surprised, but Barbados mentions she still looks the same, but at that time she was already a perfect warrior. Mine thanks him for the compliment, stating that he could reach her level if he trains, for a thousand years. Barbados then asks who she is, but Mine replies that she's a ghost who isn't allowed to die. Barbados then notices that Fate's eye has returned to normal. 
Fate explains that he has a condition that needs him to kill monsters from time to time. If not, his eyes will become red. Barbados quickly guesses that if he doesn't kill the monsters, he will lose his mind. So, he tells Fate to return to him when he finishes doing what he needs to. He mentions that he has something important to tell him, but cannot do it now. On their way, Fate is still complaining about Mind's ability to be a glutton. Once again, she replies that anger burns lots of calories. She tries to share with him, explaining she doesn't want him to be mad at her. She even treats him like a child, feeding him beef jerky and patting his head. Greed is laughing at this, but Fate notices Mind sitting by his side and then resting her head on his thigh. He asks her what she's doing, but she simply replies that this is the best bed in the carriage, despite being so so. She quickly falls asleep, and Fate compares her with a child. He then remembers she said she was a ghost who wasn't allowed to die, and that she has something to do. He asks Greed what Mine is fighting against, but Greed doesn't reply. Fate complains, but Greed simply answers that he will see it if he stays with her. Still, Fate thinks this will become troublesome in the future. Meanwhile, Roxy's companions ask when they should be getting to Galia. Roxy replies it's literally just around the corner. A few minutes later they arrive at Barbados village. They talk about the castle and the story that now a lick monster rules it. They decide to get closer to the castle but notice there is no monsters. Mugen thinks they cleared this place recently. Barbados arrives to introduce himself, and Mugen shows his respect, mentioning Barbados is known as the Sword Saint. Roxy tries to introduce herself, but Barbados mentions she has grown well. She's initial confused, but Barbados replies he knew her parents that they asked him to name her. She's surprised to hear that, but Mugen mentions how he envies because she has a hero as a godfather. Barbados corrects them, mentioning he's a former hero. He mentions that he retired because he lost his reason to fight due to losing his family. Roxy then mentions that he managed to defeat the Lick Lord, but Barbados replies he didn't do it alone. He simply mentions it's all thanks to a person who fought alongside him. Mugen mentions the person should be a strong warrior because it's not easy to defeat a crowned monster. Miria also says that she wants to meet him, but Barbados simply replies that he left on his journey. Roxy asks for the warrior's name because she will need to report the situation later. However, Barbados refused to say it's fate. This is because fate asked him to not mention his name to anyone who asks for him. Roxy accepts this answer and apologizes for disturbing him. She decides to leave, and Barbados asks if she's heading to Galia. She's surprised because she never mentioned it. Barbados replies that's the only reason why she would be in this place. He asks if Valeric is behind her mission, but she replies that she volunteered. He tells her that this is all planned because both Hart and Barbados' families are threats to the Valeric. Roxy replies she will carry her father's wishes and protect people. Barbados is shocked to hear that her father passed away. Due to the current situation, Barbados asks if she wants to take lessons from him. She's confused, but he promises to teach her how to fight in Galia. She accepts to learn from him, and Barbados is impressed that not only she has the same type of sword as her father, but also the skills. She says that she wants to be stronger, and they continue their lessons. Meanwhile, Fate is complaining to Mind that they have been walking for a while since the last town. He's confused about this place, and notices that it's full of ruins. Mine replies this is where she was born. Fate is confused but she explains further. She was taken to the imperial capital after she was born, and she doesn't have memories of this place. But still, this is an important place to her. Fate is confused and asks if Galia wasn't destroyed 400 years ago. But Mine ignores and walks away. She stops at a random site, mentioning she found it. Fate is confused, but when he looks ahead, he sees some sort of cocoon. Greed even mentions he cannot believe one of those things are still alive. Mine starts walking again and Fate follows her, while asking Greed what is that. Greed replies it's a chimera. It's a military weapon created in Galia a long time ago by patching monsters as the core. Fate is confused, but Greed explains this is their greatest failure. They get near to it with Greed mentioning that he thought that every chimera was disabled. Mine then turns to Fate and mentions he will be paying her the favor. Fate is a bit shocked because they will have to defeat this. He checks its stats, just to find out that its lowest stat is 14 million. He also notices the Chimera skills appear as error. Greed explains that it's unstable because the monster's skills are artificially mixed. Despite the huge stats, Mine mentions this is still a child Chimera, so it should be possible to defeat it. Fate is confused and asks what he should do. Mine replies that Chimeras won't die by just simply being beaten. As long as it has a soul, it will always stay alive. Fate realizes that she needs his gluttony's soul-eating ability to deal with it. She replies with yes, mentioning it's the most sinful power to defy God. Without waiting, she jumps, saying they will be starting. 
she strikes the egg, and we see a girl inside. Suddenly, a monster comes out, and Fate notices the girl in the monster's chest. He notices how her eyes looks just like his, but Mine says the monster is trying to intimidate him. Greed even tells Fate to look the other way, otherwise he will lose his will to fight. Fate asks Mine who's that girl, and she replies it's the Chimera's core. In short, Mine reveals she needs him to give the finishing blow to the core. Fate tries refuse it by explaining that if he eats her soul, the girl will be suffering in eternal hell. Mine tells him to not be deceived, because the girl is a monster in human form. She then says that his sentimentality will lead to his own death. The monster roars and Mine grabs Fate to dodge the attack. The monster summons lava, and Fate asks Greed to become a scythe and cut it. Greed refuses because he cannot cut that attack. Mine then suddenly stops and tells him to stay behind her. She slashes the lava and stops the attack. She then claims they must split up and slices the monster's arms. Fate tries to stall time by using his petrification arrows, but Greed tells him to focus because the monster is already regenerating. Fate is confused, but Greed explains chimeras were built to fight independently for eternity. Fate doesn't know how they can even defeat it, but Mine slices the monster's arm again. He notices how she's more powerful than before, and Greed explains it's all about her weapon, Sloth. The more she swings Sloth, the stronger and heavier it gets. The Chimera shouts in pain, and Fate starts to feel some heavy pressure. Mine lands next to him, explaining the Chimera is trying to evolve. Suddenly, wings appear from the Chimera's back. Mine orders Fate to stay behind her back, and he gets reminded of Roxy. He realizes that he's being protected again and feels disgusted with himself. He proudly said that he wanted to help Roxy, but in the end, he's always being protected by someone. He wants to change and become stronger. So, he tells Mine that he's going to unleash his half-starvation mode. Mine simply replies that if he makes a mistake, he will be swallowed by the gluttony. Fate knows it, but he doesn't care. He cannot help her if he doesn't activate it. He activates his skill and tries his best to control it. However, that comes with a big pain. The Chimera doesn't wait and attacks, but Mine blocks it. Suddenly, she hears Fate's voice, mentioning it's time to strike back. The Chimera attacks with feathers that will explode on contact, and Fate decides to use them to their advantage. He uses Greed to cut the feathers and create an explosion. He then leaps into the air and turns Greed into a bow. He used the Dust Cloud to charge Greed with 10% of his stats, plus Sandstorm magic. Upon shooting, the Chimera gets petrified. Mine uses this chance to attack and unleashes Sloth. Her attack is so powerful that she cuts the Chimera's feet. Greed tells Fate to hurry up and attack before it regenerates. However, the Chimera activates a barrier skill. Fate decides to cut it using his scythe, but it does nothing. Greed orders him to find the flow of mana and hit the weak point. Fate quickly finds it and hits it, damaging the Chimera's core. However, he notices the girl is looking away and backs away. He decides to avoid eye contact and leaps away, but that just allows the Chimera to fly away. He lands and notices that his eye is bleeding. Greed explains his time is almost up. Since there isn't much time, Mine tells him to get on her weapon. He's confused, but she explains she will launch him into the air so that he can defeat the Chimera before it regenerates. He follows her instructions and she throws him away. Still, this stupid dude accepts to do be launched, but doesn't know how to defeat it. Greed gives him the promo of the day, for 20% of his stats, he can the second stage ultimate. Fate accepts the deal, and the scythe evolves. Greed explains their target is the center of mana. Fate analyzes and finds out the center of mana is the girl. However, the Chimera traps him inside its shield barrier. The Chimera's plan is to burn itself and take Fate with it. Without much time, Fate starts spinning in midair, combined with flames and pierces the girl. This creates a huge explosion, but something strange happens to him. First his telepathy skill activates, and he sees both the Chimera Core girl and Mine hugging each other. Second, his gluttony skill activates, but instead of the usual excitement, he feels lonely. Greed explains that's how it works. He reveals that the Chimera Core is an inferior version, but in the end, it's one of Fate's kin. Meanwhile, Mine is simply watching the Chimera Core girl turn into stone and falling. Fate lands and approaches Mine, asking if she knew the girl. Mine explains she has forgotten what happened a long time ago, but once they become a chimera, they must defeat them. Because if they don't, more people will die. Fate starts to realize that he also could become a lunatic who goes on a rampage. So, he decides to ask Mine for a favor. If one day, he loses himself to gluttony, he wants her to kill him. Because he knows, she's the only who can kill him if he goes berserk. Mine then walks towards him and hugs him. Fate is confused, but she explains that she will do it when it comes the time. 
In the aftermath, Fate mentions he will be heading to Babylon and asks about mine. She mentions that she still has to build a village for her people. He's confused because he didn't expect that was a true story. However, she mentions she has a certain feeling about him. She mentions that Fate will be dead before they meet again. He's confused about it. Turns out that Fate decided to reset his stats to unlock Greed's shield mode. In short, his current stats are all back to one. Therefore, she thinks he will die soon. He realizes his mistake and asks her help to hunt and raise his stats. However, she walks away and asks for money. He manages to reach Babylon a few hours later, but Greed is complaining because Fate is heading to the wrong gate. Fate turns away and asks if Greed has been here before. Greed confirms, mentioning his previous wielder was also a deadly skin user. They finally enter the city, but there's a problem. Fate is a glutton and the food prices are five times higher than the capital. The Holy Knights arrive at the same time, and Fate puts on his mask before he sees Roxy from a distance. Fate explains that every type of warriors come to Babylon. It can be from mercenaries who have a grudge against holy knights and even former holy knights. Greed then says that as long as he's strong, he will be forgiven. That's how Babylon works, because they want anyone to help them defeat the monsters. Fate realizes this is the best place for him to stay. Meanwhile, Roxy meets another holy knight named Alistar. He claims to be honored to be working with her, the heir of Heart family. Roxy thanks him for taking care of Babylon after her father passed away. Alistar stays humble, mentioning he couldn't help her father despite being fighting beside him. He apologizes to her, and she asks if he was there during his final moments. Alistar confirms, and Roxy tells him to keep his head up because she's there to carry on her father's will. She promises that together, they will protect the people from the monster's invasion. They shake hands, but Miria thinks that Alistar is looking at Roxy with a perverted look. She wants to save her because she considers Roxy's in danger. But Mugen stops her, mentioning she will lose her head. Roxy then turns to Mugen and Miria, saying they will be inspecting the town. Meanwhile, Fate is walking around while thinking about his finances. It costs a 100 gold coins per day to stay in an inn, and one gold coin for breakfast. Suddenly, Greed tells him to stop and look left. He sees a store display, and Greed claims the scabbard is calling for him. Fate thinks it looks expensive, but Greed replies they can get money by beating monsters. The store owner comes out, asking if Fate is looking for something. However, he suddenly starts to act like a freak, checking out Fate's cloak. He notices the burn marks, and thinks it was caused by a fireball or a powerful heat attack. Fate is pretty impressed because the guy noticed it right away. Greed claims this guy is talented and they can trust him, but he's only interested in getting the scabbard. Fate gives in and asks how much the scabbard is. The guy replies that's just a sample and he can make one that fits the sword. Fate then handles Greed and asks what he can do. The guy checks the sword, mentioning he never saw a one-handed sword like that. He calls Greed fantastic, making the sword get all cocky. The guy then starts to think what kind of scabbard he can make to match Greed. He has some idea, but it will cost 500 gold coins. Fate is shocked and refuses the deal by running out of the shop. Greed simply tells him to hunt monsters and get some funds. But Fate still thinks 500 gold coins is a rip-off. He considers the princes in the city to be really high, and he doesn't think he should spend that much. He decides to head out and hunt some monsters when he's approached by some guys. They ask if he wants to join them in hunting monsters, since another pair of hands isn't too much. He asks if Fate wants to enlist the army as a volunteer, but Fate simply rejects it. He won't be joining any group. The group leader apologizes and wonders if Fate is a former holy knight because he wants to go solo. Fate is confused, but the guy simply mentions he never guessed it because he looks shabby. He apologizes, as if he was afraid and walks away. Greed tells Fate that he needs to dress up properly, otherwise, he will have to deal with people like that. Fate cannot believe he must dress up just for self-preservation. He claims that he will be getting something cool, but first they must hunt. After walking for a bit, he reaches a deserted piece of land. Greed explains that Galia is just beyond the border. Fate complains about the smell. But Greed explains that's because there are dead monsters everywhere. Fate continues walking but there's something strange in the air. Greed explains that spores. Fate is confused when he sees some moss on the rocks, but Greed explains their spores contain poison. He advises Fate to not breathe it, but Fate complains that he should have warned him much earlier. Greed explains that if he inhales too much, the moss will grow roots inside Fate's lungs. Fate gets scared, but Greed simply replies this is Galia. Fate continues walking, and Greed detects a small-scale stampede right away. Fate tries to look around but cannot find it. Suddenly, some orcs appear in the horizon. 
Greed explains they're the most common monsters in Galia, and they use nature weapons. Greed identifies 50 monsters, and tells that orcs are smart and attack in coordination. Therefore, fate should treat it like fighting against people. Fate accepts the advice and decides to put what Barbados taught him into practice. He rushes in, but he suddenly sees one orc being headshotted by an arrow. The group from before appears and starts the attack. Fate stops, thinking they were quicker, but Greed complains. He tells Fate to snatch their prey for the sake of his luxury. Fate tries to reason, mentioning it's bad manners to steal monsters from other people. However, Greed simply replies there's no rules or manners when it comes to monster hunting. Suddenly, more orcs appear. Greed explains there's two squadrons of them as reinforcements. Fate is still acting like a good boy, and thinks he can deal with them since it won't be considered stealing. Greed uses this chance to mock Fate, calling him an ally of justice. Fate rushes in, using his speed to get as close as possible. But the orc shoots some fire arrows. Fate turns Greed into a shield that destroys the arrows. Greed explains that this new form repels any physical and magical attacks. He asks Fate to praise him, but our boy tells him to shut up because they must battle. Fate doesn't know how he should approach the fight. Greed simply tells him to use the shield and smash the orcs. Fate then starts running with the shield in front of him. He blocks every attack and runs into the orcs, slicing them in half. Greed explains that shield bash, it requires some strength to use it, but Fate already has it. Fate continues running into to the orcs, slicing every orc around. By the end, all his stats reach over 2 million once again. However, Fate is feeling surprised because his gluttony skill is quiet despite defeating several orcs. Greed asks if the skill became quiet after he defeated Haniel. Fate confirms and thinks it's because he trained to control the skill with Barbados. Greed accepts the possibility and tells him to cut the ears and return to the city. Once he returns, everyone is shocked to see that Fate defeated that many orcs alone. He gives them to the clerk, who's also shocked. However, one of the guys from before accuses Fate of stealing their orcs. Greed mentions that Fate actually saved them, but the guy tries to take Fate's bags away. Fate breaks the guy's hand, but the rest of the group decides to attack him. They all gang on him at the same time, but Fate defeats everyone with a single punch. The group leader throws a dagger and attacks Fate, but our boy blocks it with the bag and kicks him on his family insurance. In the end, Fate gets a payment of 100 gold. However, Roxy gets inside and asks if he's the one who knocked down this whole group. Fate is shocked but explains everything. Roxy realizes this was in self-defense, and Fate asks what she will do to him. Roxy claims he went too far but she's responsible for the decline of security in Babylon because there's no holy knight to keep it on check. She decides to not only let Fate go, but the group of ugly guys will spend a night in jail for their misbehavior. Fate then realizes that he became taller than Roxy, but she asks if he heard her. He replies that he did, but Miriam complains that it's rude to wear a mask in front of Roxy. Roxy is fine with it, especially because Mugen claims that a mask can be an important piece of equipment. Fate thanks her, and she asks his name. Fate replies he's corpse. She asks him to not cause problems, and to learn how to dress with style. Fate gets shocked to hear it and runs away in panic. Everyone is confused by this, especially Mugen. He claims that Fate looks weak, but he managed to beat everyone. Minutes later, Fate is walking on the street, thinking that Roxy might hate him. Greed replies it's better than finding out his identity. The sword then takes advantage of Roxy's words to dress well and asks again for a scabbard. Suddenly, the guy from the previous store appears, mentioning that he heard that Fate managed to beat the ruffians. Fate sighs because people are gossiping, but the guy suddenly asks him to fight while wearing his clothes. Fate is confused, and the guy introduces himself as Jade, a craftsman. The guy explains he opened his shop three months ago and is still a nobody. So, he wants Fate to use his equipment, therefore getting some sort of ad revenue. Jade explains he was looking for a great warrior to create this partnership. And since it's free gear, Fate accepts the deal. After some work, Fate now looks like Kirito with a mask. However, Jade asks for 80 gold coins in return. Just like us, Fate is shocked. Jade then asks for 40 gold coins instead. But still, he got scammed. Fate then decides to get some food and notices a bar filled up with people. Greed mentions the food there is delicious, but Fate just wants something cheap. He decides to walk away, when suddenly, a beautiful girl comes out of the bar. She looks at Fate, and she suddenly feels an impulse inside him. He cannot take his eyes off her. Greed mentions he's getting the hang of it, and the girl walks his way. The girl then calls by his name, mentioning she's been waiting for him. Fate is shocked because she knows his identity and name despite the mask. She laughs it out, saying they're both one of a kind. Fate realizes she's a deadly sin skill owner. She introduces herself as Eris the Lust. 
They get inside, and she tells him to remove his mask because she can see through it anyways. Fate notices something happens when he looks at her in the eyes. She apologizes, mentioning it's an effect of her lust skill. In short, the skill makes everyone to fall in love with her. Fate asks what she means by stating that she was waiting for him. She reveals she's been watching him for a long time since he was in the capital. She explains she wanted to contact him after he awakened his gluttony skill. However, she didn't contact him before because she was waiting for him to meet Greed. Fate asks if she knows about mine too. Eris claims she doesn't know much about mine because she's a first generation deadly skin owner. She explains that just like Fate, she's second generation. Fate is confused, but she explains that she isn't in good terms with mine because she has more plot. Eris then thanks him for defeating Haniel, and Fate asks if she knows everything. She replies that she doesn't know who put the cocoon there. She then explains there's a lot more chimeras, and it will be hard to deal when they evolve. She claims the Holy Knights will have a hard time to beat them. She then wants to talk with him about the main topic. She explains that she has two identities. One is a deadly skill user, and the second is a guardian of the kingdom. In short, she holds the kingdom's interests above individuals when it comes to the future, and she wants the kingdom to proper for the next 1000 years, even if she suffers a defeat now. Fate asks what she is getting at. Eris replies that Roxy must die in the Galia expedition. Fate gets angry at Eris, but she asks if he knows about the hate phenomenon. She explains that hate builds up when he defeats monsters and accumulates over a long period of time. In the end, that hate generates a crown beast. And that happens to humans too. Fate is confused, but she replies that hate is also accumulated by the people who have suffered. In this case, it's generated by oppression, discrimination and poverty caused by holy knights. Roxy is the only holy knight who cares about people. So if she dies, it will create a huge amount of hatred, which will swallow all the other hate and give birth to a human being with a new power. And that being will give birth to those with superior skills to help the kingdom. Eris claims that Roxy's death will lead the kingdom to a bright future, but fate gets angry, denying it. He claims that no good thing will be created from Roxy's death. He walks away, but Eris reveals that nobody can stop it because the plans are already in motion. However, fate doesn't care about the opponent or intentions. He will protect Roxy at any cost. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.